Okay, uh, well, thank you so much. And it's like uh, 115 um, attendees so far, which is great. So uh, I'll just go ahead and start. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for tuning in to this District 7 Town Hall. My name is Andrew Lewis. I'm the Seattle City Council member for Seattle City Council District 7, um, which represents neighborhoods from uh, Magnolia and Queen Anne all the way down to Pioneer Square. Um, representing uh, also downtown South Lake Union, my own neighborhood of Uptown, um, Belltown, among other um, parts of, of West Central Seattle. Uh, this town hall is really going to be an opportunity to, uh, first off at the end, solicit uh, questions and feedback as we go into our summer balancing session. And I do want to hear from the attendees um, tuning in today, um, their thoughts, their feedback, um, on the pressing issues that are facing the council and facing the unprecedented decisions that we have to make um, uh, to make significant balancing cuts to our budget. Uh, we are facing a $300 million shortfall. Um, as folks can well imagine, the uh, economic fall off uh, due to COVID-19 um, has dramatically impacted a lot of the regressive um, taxes that the city relies on, um, including sales, B&O, um, soda tax, uh, you name it, going down the list. Uh, those revenues have fallen off, and as a result, um, the city has had to uh, take measures uh, to raise new progressive revenue, as we did with the Jumpstart um, proposal, um, but also to make some balancing cuts, and that's what we were debating this summer. Obviously, none uh, loom larger than the prospects of significant reductions to the Seattle Police Department. Um, the mayor has submitted, uh, just by way of background, a 10% um, or uh, $20 million um, cut. Um, there are discussions on the city council uh, of um, creating larger uh, cuts and larger reductions as part of our balancing strategy. Um, I, along with many of my colleagues, am committed to realizing a 50% um, uh, reduction uh, to the police department over time. Um, it remains to be seen whether a plan will come together uh, to realize those cuts in the summer session, but we do continue um, to discuss it and there will be more amendments about how a plan like that might come together tomorrow. So um, that's just by way of a quick introduction of, of uh, uh, why we're all here today together. Um, I do want to say that uh, in addition to the feedback, some of the big takeaways I want folks to get from this town hall um, is a variety of different first response options, not just things that we in the city of Seattle are cultivating already through the fire department, or through our partnerships with service providers like the Downtown Emergency Service Center um, and our ongoing conversations with organizers at Decriminalize Seattle, um, but also uh, examples of systems from around the country. And I, I am really honored to be joined a little later um, by uh, some folks from Denver, Colorado, who are working on a response system called STAR, um, who will be able to share their experience of organizing and setting up this community-based first response and how that might complement some of the things we're already doing. We'll hear from Dan Malone at Downtown Emergency Service Center about the Mobile Crisis Team, which is a King County City of Seattle partnership based out of the Downtown Emergency Service Center. Um, we're going to hear from Chief Scoggins, who will be uh, the first guest of the town hall, um, about uh, Health One and some of the uh, related programs the fire department is doing to respond to low acuity calls and be an alternative form of first response. Um, we're gonna be talking to uh, um, Sharon Lee and some other service providers about uh, some new interventions that the council is working on um, to get more shelter spaces for folks experiencing homelessness that are non-congregate, to get them inside, um, to get folks out of these um, unsanctioned encampments and inside where they can live with dignity and where they can, um, uh, you know, be sheltered and, and not subject to uh, um, the environment, the um, hostile environment or um, uh, ongoing chronic um, public health problems. So this is really going to be an interesting town hall. I encourage folks to, uh, to share their questions through the, the previous um, process through the, uh, uh, that, that was stated through the, the Q&A thread. Um, someone from my staff will be monitoring those questions and at the end um, we will take them. Since we have some folks who are um, on a tight schedule today, I'm reserving all the questions till the end. I know that um, uh, Chief Scoggins will only be with us here for the beginning of the, of the town hall, um, for example, and, and I know that our friends um, in Denver 
um, have uh, um, um, a, a tight timeline as well. And I wanna make sure we hear from everybody. So with that, um, I'm gonna jump in. We're gonna start with Chief Scoggins. Uh, and um, what I'm gonna ask initially here, um, Chief, is uh, first, if you wanna uh, give a, a brief introduction, um, and then I'll start asking you some questions, particularly about the Health One um, program, and we can start really diving into it. But first, thank you so much for joining us here. And thank you so much for your service uh, to the city and the great service of the fire department. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and talk to us about the important work um, our first responders in the fire department are doing and, and ways that we can build on that progress in the future. So I'll, I'll let you do a brief introduction and then um, we'll just have a conversation about uh, about emergency response. So thank you so much for joining Sure. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis. Thank you for having me. Um, as Councilmember mentioned, my name is Harold Scoggins, uh, Fire Chief here in the Seattle Fire Department. I've been here since 2015. I've been in the fire service for 30 years. This is my 30th year of service. A um, lot of different experiences along the way. Spent the first 26 years down in Southern, Southern California, and I've been here in Seattle for the last five. So I'm really excited about the work that we're doing in this area. And our goal is to serve, to meet people where they are, to get them the service that they need. That's our goal with our programs. Great, thank you so much, Chief. So I wanna talk a little bit particularly about Health One. And, and the first things I wanna ask you at the top, if you could just give a, a, a general description of Health One. And we do have a couple of um, uh, visual aids that can, uh, for the public viewing at home to, to track along with our conversation. Um, and I wonder if, uh, if IT could maybe get those up um, so that we can, we can have them in front of us. Um, but Chief, I want to ask you, you know, first, what, what Health One is, and, and also if you could define um, the concept of, um, of low acuity, like a low acuity response, and, um, and why that's such a big deal. Absolutely. And, and in order to do that, I need to paint the bigger picture for you. So each year, the Seattle Fire Department responds to approximately 95,000 emergency responses. And of that 95,000, approximately 77,000 are EMS related. That means there's a medical emergency of some sort, and that's what the caller communicates. Of that 77,000, about 17 to 20,000 of those calls are ALS, which are advanced life support calls. That means it's a cardiac arrest event, it's a stroke event, it's a respiratory distress event, it's a traumatic event. But what's left is about 60,000 responses annually. So what, what I noticed um, when I got here a number of years ago is many of that last 60,000 calls um, needed something other than um, an ER. And our goal was to try to figure out how do we get that person what they need. And, and that's been the puzzle that we've been trying to put together. So as we've been developing our mobile integrated health program, we've done a few things over the last five years. We have four social workers on staff now. Um, that's really important for us. They make all of our programs go. We have a high utilizer individual um, program and a high utilizing facility program. So what one of our social workers does is they look at uh, the people that are in our system that are calling 911 for medical emergencies on a pretty regular basis and we reach out to them. We try to figure out, you know, do they have the services that they need? What can we help them with? Can we connect them up with social services to try to provide the person what they need to get the care that they need? Because what they need, they don't need a 911 response, but clearly they need something. We also have a high utilizing facility location. We go to places over and over and over again. So with those facilities, we'll go in, we'll do training and different things like that. We also have a vulnerable adult program. So our firefighters respond each day. They may see um, um, those in our community who are older in need of certain things. We may respond because they don't have their prescriptions. So we need to figure out a way to make that happen. We may re respond because they don't have the food that they need. We try to figure out a way to make that happen. Their place they're living may be um, in need of some help. So we figure out a way to make that happen with our vulnerable adult program. And then the third component is Health One. And Health One is the unit that what we're doing is we're meeting people where they are to provide the service that they need. Because like I said, that of that 60,000 call, 
um, that that were left over, about 30,000 of those kind of fit into the low acuity type category. Some of those low acuity calls, they do need to go to the hospital and get treatment for whatever the issue is. But many of that 30,000 calls that are left, they do not. They are people who may be in crisis. They are people who may need shelter. They are people who may need um, a warm place to sleep. They are people who may um, be facing some challenges for um, alcohol or, or, or drug addiction. So they need all of these different things that we really were not set up to get them. So what we did was we launched Health One. So Health One is two firefighter EMTs with um, uh, a whole lot of additional training and a social worker. So each day they're on, on our Health One vehicle and, and what their skill sets are very different because the normal 911 response, if it's a BLS response, we're probably on scene for probably 18 minutes. And then we turn it over and go to the next call. And within that 18 minutes, we have a lot of things to decide. What care do they need? What hospital do they need to go to? And how do we get them that care? Each one of our Health One calls lasts about an hour and 40 minutes. That means that we're taking the time and if you need a, um, a medical appointment, we're gonna get you that medical appointment. If you need a ride there, we're probably gonna give you a ride. If we need to find you a place to sleep and shelter, we're gonna call the shelters and see what's open. If you're in crisis at that time, we're gonna call someone to, to help you with whatever you need at that point in time. That generally takes a lot longer and a, 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 you need a variety of skill sets. So between our firefighters who are very used to working out in the environment and our social worker, who's um, very used to meeting people's needs on the social service side, we think it's a good formula and, it, and that's what it's shown us to be so far. So our unit is really doing a lot of good work and taking care of people, meeting them where they are and getting them what they need. Thank you so much for that uh, broad overview, Chief, and thank you so much for um, uh, for really being, you know, a great uh, innovator in driving um, this Health One pilot. I know my predecessor Sally Bagshaw um, was really instrumental in getting the money together, and and uh, you know, I, I know that this year the department has done a good job um, uh, putting putting that vision into something tangible and into practice. So I just wanted to add, talk a little bit um, about uh, kind of what where Health One currently stands, like how big um, is the program and what are some of the opportunities for scalability going forward? Because my understanding is it's just um, uh, the one vehicle so far and the one team, um, but what could be the, the potential scalability of this approach? Yeah, so, so council member, you are correct. Uh, currently, we do have one vehicle and one team that's tied to our Health One program and those other components that are behind it with our high utilizer program and our vulnerable adult program. And they all work together with our mobile integrated health program. But as you mentioned, this is scalable. Um, we're working in the area of the city that needs the most help right now, um, which is the downtown area where a lot of these calls are. But this is completely scalable and, and it makes sense to scale it after being in service since last November, November of 2019 to July of 2020. We have really seen an impact of the work that they can do and the partnerships that they have created to help change people's lives. And, and the folks who, whose lives they're changing, the responses that um, Health One is making, um, can you give maybe some some like tangible examples of like what kind of situations does Health One respond to, um, and then what kind of assistance are they able to provide one-on-one uh, -on -one to folks who are requesting um, this service? Sure, and so they're requested in in really three different ways. So one way is they're dispatched directly from our fire alarm center. So that's one way that they could be dispatched to a call. The second way is through our fire units who may respond to an emergency and know that this person needs additional help. And the third way is they actually go and do follow up. So when they actually have a little downtime, they'll go and, and make the contact with someone they've seen before just to do follow up to make sure that they're doing okay and they're getting everything that they need. But the situations that you can imagine is 
um, you know, when we had a little bit of snow this year, um, we changed our model because we knew we needed to get people out of the cold into a warm place. So their, their mission was very intentional. Look for people who are out in the cold and let's find the shelter beds and let's get people into shelter. Um, a person may be in crisis. So they go, they take the time, they have the conversations. And some of the conversations are extremely hard. And I'm so proud of our social workers that we have with our firefighters because they really know how to connect with people. So once they make the connection and build the trust, then they make the calls to connect them up even further to get them help if they're in crisis. Sometimes people have a medical ailment, but they don't necessarily need an emergency room, which can be very, very expensive. So what they'll do is they'll call the local clinic. They'll see if they have an appointment available. If they have an appointment available and they don't have a way to get there, one of two things will happen. We carry taxi vouchers with us and uh, lift vouchers. We'll either give you one of those or we'll just put you in our vehicle and we'll give you a ride. Um, sometimes when they're doing the follow-up care, they find that people don't have the nourishment that they need in their place they're living or don't have their prescriptions filled. And we all know when we don't take our medications, things can get a little bit out of balance. They figure out a way to make those things happen too. So it, it's really a utility team that's serving people. And, you know, I got one more question, um, Chief, and then I'll give you the last word on this. Uh, but um, is, is Health One, as it's currently constituted, are you guys hardwired into the 911 response, or uh, does someone else go out there, flag it, and then Health One um, responds? Uh, both. Um, our dispatch center can dispatch Health One directly after they're going through their protocols or the fire unit can be on scene and call them to a scene, or they could just go do follow-up. So we're very flexible and versatile. And, and our 911 system, um, our fire alarm system is, is the secondary um, public safety answering point. All of the calls go through the primary public safety answering point, which is SPD. And if a person says fire or medical emergency, they immediately transfer that call over to us. That happens about 160 to 180,000 times a year. That results in that about 95,000 responses a year. Um, so it can happen a lot of different ways, or we can get a referral um, from the community and they'll go directly to Health One and Health One will make the connection and show up that way also. So it sounds to me like there's a lot of room, uh, given the flexibility of the mission and, and given, um, uh, I'm really hearing a lot of agility and, and the ability to respond to lots of different types of calls uh, that, that currently this, uh, this one team is, is juggling to. So, I mean, you know, I'll just, I'll just tell you um, straight up right now, I mean, I really like the work that, uh, um, that the fire department's low acuity teams are doing. It'll definitely be a priority of mine to, to protect and expand um, the service. and. Uh, you know, I really appreciate you coming by here to uh, talk to the people of District 7 about it. I know there's a, a lot of District 7 folks are already extremely grateful because because it's Health One serves downtown. So a lot of um, uh, people in my district are very well aware of it already. But I do think that uh, there's a lot of chance here for, for scalability and it's a great way forward. And um, I, I think the department's doing a, uh, has done a tremendous job with the pilot. So, you know, with that, Chief, I'd like to, I know that um, uh, we're going a little a little longer than I thought we'd go. I'd like to give you the, the last word on this and then um, uh, you know, wish you a, a pleasant afternoon. Sure, absolutely. And, and I would be remiss if I did not thank Councilmember Bagshaw, who was a champion for standing up this program, and our low acuity manager, his name is John Aaronfield, absolutely amazing. But we haven't done this in the vacuum. I can remember it was probably about a year and a half or two years ago when we had a one-day conference here. We held right here in Seattle, and we, we invited 25 fire departments from around the nation to come here and talk about this one issue. And we invited departments from California to Arizona to Texas to Vancouver, BC, all with similar type programs. 
and all sharing information and ideas. So we're really working hard together as a, as a public safety professional organization to figure out what's going on in Arizona that we can use here in Seattle and vice versa. What's going on down in San Diego that we can use here and we're sharing that way too. So we're always tweaking and looking for a better way to do it. I'm really proud of our firefighters and our social workers who are doing this work. And it's like I said, Five years ago, we had no social workers on staff. Now we have four. I talked to my good friend in Spokane. I believe they have about 12 to 16. That shows the transition that our profession is making in meeting people where they are. Well, Thank hey, you. You know, you know, we, let, let's try to catch up to Spokane. I'm willing to work with you on that. That sounds great. And um, thank you for all the work you're doing. And, and uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Chief. I really appreciate it. All right, thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, so transitioning now, uh, Health One and sort of low acuity um, first responses, uh, like I just discussed with Chief Scoggins, um, are, you know, could be one of the tools in our toolbox. Um, there are examples of um, uh, first responses that are entirely based in, in a community, um, uh, nonprofits or or community service providers that that offer an interesting path forward as well. And I'm really um, proud to be joined here today um, by Roshan Bliss. And and Roshan, I, I heard you. I think I saw you on the panel here. Um, there you are. Okay, I, I see you. Um, you're you're being joined by one other person um, who who I didn't get the name of before I went on here. Who is there? Someone else with you? That's Carly Ceylon um, from Mental Health Center of Denver. Okay, great. Let me see. Okay, great. Yeah, they're they're okay. Excellent. So, um, uh, how's your last name pronounced, um, Carly? Salon. Salon. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, thank you guys for joining us. Just as a little bit of background, um, you know, as a lot of folks who are watching probably know, over the last couple of weeks, I've been advocating for a, a form of community-based low acuity. Um, first response called CAHOOTS uh, or um, Crisis Assistance Helping Out in the Streets, which is a program from Eugene, Oregon, um, that is based out of a clinic called the White Bird Clinic uh, down there. Um, you know, it, it's, it's no small thing to try to adapt from the ground up a, a sort of, or adopt a grassroots uh, method of first response um, like that. And we have a lot of um, uh, tools here that we can build on and we'll be hearing from Dan Malone later about some of the things um, DESC is doing. But um, I, I think that the experience with STAR, and I'll let you guys uh, um, fill in what, that, what the acronym stands for, uh, but Denver has recently started up a program called STAR, um, which is based on Kahoot. So they, they have gone through, or they are still going through the same process that we would be as a community in designing a system of first response like this. Um, and I wanted to, to bring them on because I think there's a lot of things we could learn as a, as a community here in Seattle from their experience and sort of getting this going in Denver and kind of what's been working for them, um, the community driven process they've used and, and the success of their um, star pilot um, so far. So um, with that, I, I think I want to hand it over and, um, and uh, uh, Roshan and, and um, Carly, I'll let you guys sort of um, uh, uh, tag team on, on how you want to kind of give the overview. But I, you know, first off, I would obviously be interested in uh, you know, uh, introducing yourselves, uh, sort of your roles in, in that process and, and your roles in Denver. Um, and then also um, uh, just kind of a brief overview of, of what STAR is and what your process has been and, and kind of where it stands now. Great, thank you very much. Um, Carly, you wanna do introductions? I can do some background and then you talk about what's actually going on. Read my mind. <laughs> Um, well, my name is Rashan. Hello, everyone. Um, I am one of the co-chairs of a grassroots organization out here in Denver called uh, Denver Justice Project. Um, we've been around for about five years, um, working on transforming law enforcement um, by reimagining um, how public safety can be achieved um, without relying all the time on police um, or the or incarceration. Um, and uh, I, Denver Justice Project helped kind of start the conversation and, and supported the um, growth of this, this, what has become a pilot of a um, model of alternative emergency response based explicitly on the CAHOOTS model from uh, Eugene. So happy to be here. Carly, you want to tell them? 
Yeah, absolutely. My name is Carly Salon. I'm the program manager of criminal justice services at the Mental Health Center of Denver. Um, and I'm a clinical social worker and, and um, was lucky enough to go out on the site visit um, that Rashawn kind of spearheaded um, out to Cahoots in Eugene last year. Um, and one of the, the programs that my supervisor and myself have been running for quite a while is a, a co-responder program, which I know you guys also have in, in Seattle as well. Um, and really, you know, saw Cahoots as sort of a, a 2.0 version of that program. Um, working with the police, we recognized that a lot of the calls that we showed up on didn't really need a law enforcement officer there or didn't have a law enforcement solution. Um, so this model was very valuable to us in uh, the sense that we could keep police doing police work um, and get the right response to individuals when we, um, you know, have someone in crisis in our community. Awesome. Um, so I'll just give a little bit of background. Um, Carly can say maybe a little bit of what's going on now in the van because she's on it. Um, and then we'll see what else is left, uh, Councilman. Um, so like I said, um, Denver Justice Project is a grassroots organization. Um, we have an abolitionist uh, framework where we think that um, we use the wrong tools to manage um, public safety um, and that you know, they say that when you're holding a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Um, and we feel like policing uh, is the hammer that our communities and our cities are kind of holding and trying to deal with every problem with. Um, and our interest in bringing something like a hoots to Denver um, kind of started formally with a, a, a community forum back in 2017 called It Doesn't Have to Be Like This, where we were trying to um, showcase alternatives to cops, courts, and cages, um, the kind of major pillars of the criminal justice system. Um, and we ended up uh, inviting, kind of cold calling the White Bird, the good people at White Bird Clinic, um, and asking them to kind of do a video address, which they did. Um, and folks were very impressed with the model um, and even more impressed with the fact that a lot of the um, initial funding for CAHOOTS came out of the city's police budget. Um, and we committed to um, trying to bring that type of model to Denver. Um, it started off with a conversation with a um, well-known um, Chicano uh, movement-based um, social work services, uh, social work agency called Servicios de la Raza. Um, and they helped us kind of start networking with others in the city who um, would be supportive. Um, and it turned into a conversation about um, taking a sort of delegation of folks from 911, um, the safety departments, mental health providers, um, social workers, a couple of grassroots organizations, and the uh, members of the DPD, Denver Police Department that is, um, to Eugene uh, to go see what this process um, looks like, what the, the CAHOOTS program was like. Um, and we helped bring um, that delegation out to, Cahoot, out to, to Eugene. Um, and folks kind of saw the lights um, and uh, the man who eventually became our police chief out here, Paul Pazin, um, really was supportive from the very beginning, um, seeing that, you know, this is so, like police are doing more than they ever should have been a, give, given more responsibilities than they ever should have been given. Um, and he and a lot of others from DPD were eager to see this kind of alternative um, rise here in, in Denver because it meant that um, police could be doing things they were better suited for, um, which is handling, you know, kind of violent crime instead of these mental health issues or substance issues or, or crises of homelessness. Um, and so we, a work group formed um, shortly after the trip um, with a lot of different stakeholders, including um, lots of folks from the city and county of Denver um, and several grassroots organizations, service providers, um, and folks from Mental Health Center of Denver, where Carly works. Um, and we started basically planning and plotting uh, what it would take to um, launch a pilot of this kind of process, uh, this CAHOOTS type model out here in Denver. Um, and we got some funding from a local um, public foundation, uh, which is a kind of innovative thing out here we have in Denver called Caring for Denver. Um, and with that money, um, we were able to launch uh, on June 1st, a um, six to 12 month pilot of uh, the support team assisted response initiative, um, which is the kind of Denver version of CAHOOTS. Um, right now it's only in operation 
in one sort of like downtown district um, from 10 to 6 p.m. Um, but they are um, hooked into the 911 infrastructure um, and they send uh, people like Carly and a paramedic out with no police response um, to or involvement uh, to handle these kinds of calls. Um, Carly, you want to say a little bit more about what it, what it looks like to be in the van and what are yeah. also Absolutely. Um, it's been great. I think one of the, you know, we really hit the ground running um, on June 1st and I, and I think um, a lot of that success was due to the preparation of our 911 communication center, um, working with the Eugene, Oregon communication center to sort of develop a decision tree um, that appropriately triages low risk calls to the van. Um, so I think our, our call volume and, and how busy we've been is kind of a testament to that decision tree working really well. Um, I will also just kind of highlight that um, we're up over 150 calls uh, since June from that was June 1st to about the beginning of July. So we're probably well over that now. Um, and that we haven't had to request police backup um, on any of those calls. Uh, zero. We've been able to handle them. And I think that you know, is a very, um, you know, that's exactly what we want and also shows that we're making it to the right type of calls. Uh, we're not needing that that extra backup or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's myself and, and my supervisor, Chris Richardson, who's staffing the van, um, really, you know, working with the community group. That decision was made because, uh, you know, the Denver Health Paramedics and Chris Richardson and myself are already sort of employed doing this work. Uh, and we're essentially just reassigned a few days to cover this van. So we were um, the most cost-effective approach in, in the sense that new staff wasn't gonna have to be hired um, and, and additional salaries kind of added to the, the initial budget request. Um, so that's one way that we, we uh, kept costs down in our, our Denver Health Paramedics who um, they work with our local hospital authority um, were also kind of on board um, to staff the van with us. Um, we go on all different types of calls. Um, some, you know, just to kind of give you guys an idea, we go uh, to low risk um, calls where individuals are experiencing suicidal ideation, maybe are not in imminent risk or they don't have an, an immediate plan, um, but they're, they're needing support. So we will go and, and provide support to those individuals. Um, a lot of resource calls, we get calls, you know, that come out as an, an indecent exposure. Um, and we show up and it's it's a woman experiencing homelessness who's trying to change her clothes in the alley because she doesn't have a private place to do so, right? So we get there and she's like, you know, hey, I just am trying to change my clothes. Um, and we're, we can connect her to a day shelter where she can access, you know, private changing rooms and showers and, and meals and all that kind of stuff. Um, also relying very heavily, you know, uh, Chris, my supervisor and myself uh, come from a case management background. We rely very heavily on our uh, vast knowledge of community resources and the community partnerships that we've kind of built um, over the years of doing this work in Denver. Um, we have contacts at the VA that we reach out to frequently when we find an individual who's a veteran um, on the star van and have, some, have had some really incredible um, connection back to the VA I and mean, the VA will basically, you know, say, hey, can you bring them up right now to the VA? And we'll say, sure, we'll put them in the back of the van and, and reconnect them. Um, so it's really great uh, to be able to solve those problems um, in the moment. Our uh, initial data is kind of showing that we're actually a bit quicker than law enforcement on these calls, um, which I think shows that we're able, you know, when you have sort of the right professionals showing up, um, we're able to sort of wrap these situations up very quickly just because we, we sort of know um, um, what resources are available and are able to do that in a pretty low barrier way. Um, I'm trying to think what else we should kind of highlight. Um, well, here, could, could I maybe jump in for a second and ask you a question? I, I, I'm chomping at the bit to ask a question. Yeah, no, please. This is, this is all great, and I, and I love um, listening to what you guys are doing because I think it's so um instructive for for how we can pursue something like this um i, I want to uh to go back and just sort of i know you mentioned you've responded to about 150 calls you you haven't um requested uh police assistance on any of them but i guess my first question would be are you in a position where where you can request police assistance and that would be provided in the event that you that you wanted it so that'd be my first question second question would be um, how many of those 150 calls that you have done, um, how many of those do you think that in a pre-STAR world 
uh, would have been responded to instead by police as the responder. Yeah, um, you know, I can say um, that, yeah, first of all, I, I have a police radio, um, so so does the paramedic. That's how we take our calls from dispatch uh, is over the radio. Um, so I am able to call for police cover if I need to and, and have not um, needed to, which is, which is great and exactly kind of what we see. Um, you know, I, I think that, that those calls, you know, would have likely had an officer show up at them if we didn't have any other options, right? Um, someone's requesting, you know, assistance through 911. Um, it may not be an emergent response, but um, here in Denver, it, it, we hope that it would have been a, an officer and a co-responder clinician who would have showed up so that we can still um, have that level of clinical expertise and that um, sort of social justice lens um, on scene if the police are there. Um, but of course, if the police don't need to be there, um, I think it's more appropriate to keep them doing uh, law enforcement work. Um, and I think most, most police agree. And Roshan, do you have anything to add to that too? It, it looks like maybe you were. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just add the, just underline that um, the police are not needed in, mo in almost, you know, in almost every situation where it's a mental health issue um, and even where it's substance use issues um, and especially where it's, you know, crises of homelessness, um, law enforcement is not the mode of, uh, the, that's, that's required or called for in responding to these kinds of emergencies, um, that this is this is the way that the star model works um, is mirrors um, what Cahoots does. Um, that they're tapped into nine one one, which is part of the safety department, uh, and they have the radios um, and can call for backup if they need. But they almost never need to because folks with mental health problems um, are far and away more likely to be the victims of crimes and violence than to commit them. Um, and this is just a really clear demonstration of how our cities and our country need to evolve um, better and different ways of handling mental health crises um, and these and lots of other kinds of emergencies um, that don't involve a person with a badge and a gun who often makes the situation worse or might hurt someone. Um, so like in that spirit in uh moving forward here uh um to to round this presentation out a little bit more it sounds like you were saying star uh, currently is sort of like a nine to six uh response window um how are you guys approaching like scalability and and like what the future vision for how star um could look because it sounds like you've had a good um you know first two months of, of being in operation. Um, like what is the future to this look and, and what are your scalability challenges? Yeah, um, I'll start with this, Carly, if that's okay. Um, sure. Our, our um, challenges are definitely about, you know, reaching full 24 seven coverage of a city that is, you know, many times larger than Eugene, um, where this has been an operation for, you know, 30 years, the Cahoots model. Um, and we started slow so that we could go, you know, sort of walking so we could run. Um, and the idea is that um, as the STAR program starts to get more traction, um, solidity and how, it, you know, kind of some of the approaches um, that we can also use the increased notoriety to grow new partnerships with um, local community-based um, service providers of mental health or healthcare um, supports and start finding a way to build on ramps um, for, you know, progressive, for, for people who are, who are registered nurse, nurses um, or, you know, providers of mental health care um, to get the necessary training and um, build an infrastructure whereby we can have a bank of people who can get in these vans um, and grow um, the kind of fleet of vans and the network of people and agencies that can be tapped into uh, something like STAR um, because, you know, we've got our sort of central downtown area, but Denver spans out, I'm sure like Seattle into many other areas where it's just not practical to take someone across town um, if that's the only place you know, and we need to be tapped into the more kind of neighborhood and um, um, sector-based uh, providers who can, where you can take someone who is hallucinating or just needs a place to sober up um, or 
needs, you know, to be connected to some kind of social service. Um, so right now, you know, we've got kind of till the first six months um, check in uh, to start building some of those partnerships. And our hope um, is that the, we will start building this kind of constellation of different community providers who can work together, um, hopefully through a couple of the community-based organizations that are involved, um, like the Denver Alliance for Street Health Response, um, to help move uh, from this kind of localized, just downtown response to something that can grow um, and be tapped into a sort of central administration and coordinating hub, um, but then be available um, at the city level um, and at a on a 24-7 basis. Um, so it's kind of slowly growing and organizing, um, building relationships uh, among different organizations, agencies, what have you, uh, to try to make it so that we're all ready to slowly take on um, this transformation of the way that we deal with these public health crises. What would yeah. you say about that? A lot to, to add to that. I mean, I echo what Rashawn said. Um, also, just kind of emphasizing that we recognize that crises happen outside of the hours of 10 to 6, Monday through Friday, um, of course, um, and in areas outside of our catchment area. Um, but as someone who stood up a lot of uh, criminal justice initiatives in the past few years, um, I think it's really important um, to get things dialed in to start small, you know, sort of walk before we can run um, and not bite off more that we can chew to make sure that we um, are able to be flexible to community feedback and, and are really um, using the pilot as a, as a time period to gather information on how to inform how to create a program that the city of Denver wants to see versus trying to sort of scale up and, and meet a huge need and maybe falling short. Yeah, and at least for my part, you know, I think that that's the smartest way um, for us to have gone about it. That if one of the worst consequences uh, or scenarios we could have had was to start up a program that tried to go too fast or cover too much and have a bunch of people have negative experiences, um, and suffer wait wrong call times, you know, or not have enough staff to ever get to those calls, and then have people say, well, this, this doesn't work. Um, and so we should just never call that, that line again. Um, and that's really critical um, for this to work is building trust and showing kind of effectiveness um, first so that we can get the community on board so that they'll trust when these people who, you know, aren't in uniform and are in this kind of like unmarked van um, show up that, that they'll trust them to help them. Um, and I think we should also say that, you know, the decision of the hours and the locations to serve were all based on um, data from the 911 communication center um, about where and when the kinds of calls that star in a program like this would respond to come from the most often so we kind of started in the highest need area um, and wanted to make sure we get it right and get some good practice and build some trust and rapport with the community before um, growing it to the whole city Right. So you guys have been really generous with, with your time. I really appreciate that, um, you know, given that you guys are also a, a, on mountain time and so have a little, a little uh, less time than we do here. So uh, um, I did just want to ask one more thing before we, I move on to the next um, uh, panel of people. And, you know, Roshan, I really appreciate that you just talked a lot about like credibility and, and, um, and trust and um, building that into our first response so that, you know, we have first response that is seen as trustworthy and credible with the populations um, that that first response is serving. I wonder if, if you guys could just talk a little bit about, um, you know, the ways in which that is conveyed and built and what your experience has been in the first two months. Um, I, I, I think you just alluded to the fact that um, the responders don't wear uniforms, for example. Um, but I, I, I think it'd be great to hear a little bit more about that um, before we move to the next panel, because I, I think that like details like that are very critical to the success of a, of a new type of first response and, and it'd be good to hear what your experience has been. Yeah, um, you know, we don't, I wear jeans and a t-shirt and sneakers. Um, I don't wear my, you know, ID badges on, on my lanyards because, you know, people don't know where those are from and, and it looks sort of official. Um, we have waters and snacks and Gatorade and um, you know, working on getting some socks and shoes for folks, um, you know, and, and kind of just like your, uh, your fire chief said, like, sometimes it's not about like a huge, um, 
you know, sort of epiphany moment, right? In that moment, it's just about giving someone a water and a snack and, and building some rapport um, and being a friendly face, um, you know, when, when we're having an interaction. I mean, we always hope to be able, you know, to connect people to ongoing supports and, and do those wonderful things. Um, but sometimes people aren't ready, right? So how can we just work on um, being sort of a, a good community resource for people? And that when they see the star band, they know that they can ask us for a bottle of water fresh pair of socks um, and and you know maybe one day they'll ask us for for connection to a service provider or something um, you know so we're really looking at um, every every interaction being valuable um, you know really approaching people with a non-judgmental attitude um, you know myself and and Chris the other person who stamps the man and the Denver health paramedics were big harm reductionists and we employ harm reduction principles and pretty much everything that we do um, and really you know just try to be casual and approachable um, and, and do what makes sense for people in that moment. Give them a ride, um, you know, help them, you know, make a phone call if they don't have a phone. Um, I think those are the little things um, that really matter uh, in a program like this and, and really what helps um, gain credibility with the with the community. Um, so we try to be as unassuming, you know, as, as possible. Um, our, our van is kind of stripped down of all city insignia and stuff like that. So, so it doesn't look, um, you know, intimidating to people or people don't think it's the cops when we roll up. Um, Rashawn, anything to add? No, I just I would underline the last part that like, it's really important that a big part of how you build trust is just to help people be clear that star, star workers are not cops and that they have zero law enforcement um, intentions or authority. Um, they cannot take people anywhere that they don't want to go um, and that there's no way that this call ends in you know some kind of coercion um, and that that's the way that Cahoots does it um, and you know their uniform is a hoodie with the Cahoots emblem you know and, and work boots. Uh, they I think it's really important for folks to understand that when you call 911 or the non-emergency line or the star specific line, which is also important to note that we have, um, that you don't always have to get police officers. And I think that that's a cultural shift that we need to create in our cities, our communities, um, that 911 is not just a call for police who will come enforce laws, but it's a call for people who can help you. And we need to diversify the tools in that toolbox um, to send the right, to apply the right kind of tool to the right kind of challenge. Um, and helping people understand that STAR um, is, you know, going to offer them help if they want it and will not force them to take help if they don't um, is a huge part of that trust, that trust question. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Um, I, I want to get to the next panel because we're running a little behind, but uh, you know, I wanted to take a few more minutes because um, I, I think this is really, it's really, really helpful for us in our, our process um, uh, here in Seattle, um, just to, to hear from folks going through the, the same thing who started earlier and, and just the great success that you guys have been making um, on STAR is really inspiring. So um, I wanna thank you so much and, uh, and I'll, I'll, definitely, I'll definitely be in touch as more comes up. And I'm excited to see where everything goes and um, uh, really happy that you, you guys took the time today to join us. So thank you so much. Glad to be here. Good luck. Yeah, thanks. All right. Okay, here moving moving on now to uh, to this this broader panel, and uh, I want to talk um, a little more broadly with this next set of folks, um, not just about uh, first response necessarily, but about some of the broader goals that um, Decrim Seattle has brought forward, some of the work uh, that is being done um, around uh, housing and homelessness. Um, in the city, which I know has been a really big, I mean, has been a big issue for, um, for years in Seattle, but um, during COVID has been especially uh, uh, more noticeable with, um, uh, with large um, uh, proliferation of unsanctioned encampments and just making it really clear the massive unmet needs of people that are living um, without uh, housing on the streets of the city um, and really talk about kind of what can be done, uh, what the council has been doing and, and how we, um, are going to move um, forward on that. I, I, um, I was hoping that uh, Sharon Lee would be able to join us today, but um, it, it sounds like she, um, she cannot. Um, but uh, we are, in fact, being joined by um, Sheree LaSalle, 
uh, and, and I hadn't um, heard that they had uh, uh, finally confirmed, but I'm really glad to see them here and, and that they're on. And so that is a, um, uh, uh, it's great to have, uh, have them here. Also, um, J.M. Wong uh, from Decrim Seattle and Dan Malone from the Downtown Emergency Service Center. Uh, so I wanna thank all of you um, for joining me for this last segment of the town hall. Um, I think we'll just go through um, uh, one by one, like just an introduction, um, brief overview uh, of the work that you've been doing um, and, and where, where we as a community should be going and, um, and why. Uh, and then we'll dive in. I have some questions for folks. Uh, and and for, for this panel too, um, I think if folks wanna interact with each other and, and, and build off of comments, I, I think that's um, perfectly fine. So why don't we start? Because I think, I think Sheree told my staff that they may have limited availability. So I, I wanna respect that and, um, and start with Sheree. Oh, it's okay. I'm actually doing double duty right now because of the mix up in the timing. Sorry, I will okay. yeah. sooner with that 10 minute lead time, but actually Jam is going to go ahead and do the intro and then pass it off to me. Thank you. Okay, great, great. All right. Hi everybody. Thank you, Council Member Lewis. Thank you, Star, for paving the way in this conversation. Um, I'm JM, I'm part of Decriminalize Seattle. I'm also a registered nurse um, and have worked with a lot of folks who are experiencing homelessness and um, mental health issues. And so I'm here to talk a little bit about the blueprint that Decriminalize Seattle has presented to the city. Um, first is we want a civilian 911. And it, I, we think it's really important, not just in the response of having, you know, community groups be the first responders, but also be the folks, um, civilians be the people who do the dispatch. Because currently what we know is it's already civilians who are doing the dispatch and it just reflects, um, you know, how civilians can also be in control of um, how 911 is being utilized, how the police SPD is being utilized. So that's one part of, a big part of our demand. Um, the second thing is also, we know that just having civilian 911 responses to crisis moments, that itself is not sufficient. We wanna make sure that it's actually community groups that have the principles and values that we share. For example, things like STAR had reference, so harm reduction principles, anti-racist social justice principles, you know, being trauma-informed, having culturally responsive um, cultures in, in their responses, um, those are really important for us too. And so we want money to go into CBOs that are already doing this work, that, that are currently underfunded, led by people, you know, who have experienced houselessness themselves. We want them to be able to receive the support from the city to scale up as well. And I know Sheree has done a lot of work in this area and can talk about it more. And then the last thing is we really want to look at the root causes of why there are incidents like that happening in the city, right? We know that the major crisis that Seattle has undergone in the last 10 years is the housing crisis. And so we want more harm reduction housing. We want housing for all. And that's where we need the city to actually respond to this moment. We know COVID-19 houselessness actually exacerbates the pandemic. And so this is a really appropriate time for us to not, not just respond to crisis moments, but have this long-term vision on how to address the issues that, address, um, that impact our city. So I'll pass it on to Sheree. Awesome, thank you, JM. Thank you all for having me here today. Um, we talked about wanting to civilianize 911 and I know a lot of people uh, immediately have a visceral response to that because it's just not something that we're used to hearing. Um, but, you know, education is, the, is kind of the key to making this something that we can actually do. And, and part of it is just educating people on knowing that 911 is already civilian run primarily. It's just under a department uh, that might not be able to seek out as many holistic responses or uh, community-based solutions to the issues that they're seeing when they get calls. Um, when we created programming um, specifically for Greenlight Project, where we do direct harm reduction services and outreach to street-based sex workers, drug users, and people experiencing homelessness, we started off with consistency. And I know that Star was talking about this earlier, um, our friend that, that was speaking on that, about the consistency and making sure that your purview and your availability is really spot on to build that trust for the community and then ask them what they need or what would help in situations. Um, and most folks think that people that are paid to do these type of services aren't necessarily their friends. They're trying to create um, a box that they have to fill in order to get services. And we feel like 
there are so many organizations that are culturally competent. Doing direct service is based on the exact needs of their community because they actually counseled them on what they needed and asked them what they needed. And it's efficacy in changing their material conditions and preventing crises from occurring as frequently that require any type of 911 intervention in the first place. It, it's actually, to use a really colloquial term, mind blowing that all you really have to do is ask folks what they need. Um, and they're pretty good at self determining what they need in order to prevent them from going into situations that might cause harm to others or themselves that would require an intervention of any type. And as we know, and as JM said, housing is kind of the cornerstone of people's precarity that may put them in situations where they're outdoors and exposed to neighbors that are concerned and don't know anywhere else to go except for calling 911. And it being a catch-all with only one response definitely escalates a lot of people's situations. It doesn't necessarily help. Um, seeing a badge and seeing um, an armed officer when you're already in crisis is absolutely terrifying. Seeing someone that you know that's been there for you throughout the week and you're not in crisis is kind of the answer to de-escalate. That trust, that bond, that relationship can change your outcome in those moments. So it wouldn't just be that we'd be on the phone on the other end of 911 to be dispatched when there's a crisis. It's that we've already built these relationships. They already know us. We've already asked them what they need in those situations. And when we hear that they are in crisis, we already kind of know the roadmap to help them get out of that through self-determination while respecting their agency and autonomy. And the scaling up part is it's really just a matter of resources and being able to share cultural competency and education with other organizations that would be doing service providing in this manner if they had access to the resources to scale up in that way. Um, and I know that our friend from STAR that was talking before is they started out really small and they're building coalition and they're building a membership base that wants to create cultural competency within their chosen profession, whether that be nursing or um, you know, psych or, um, you know, literal doctors, et cetera. And just like with Greenlight Project, we started off with a bunch of peers that were like, you know, these are our friends, these are our family members, these are people that are in the similar situation as us. We're gonna go ask them what they need. And as we built that, the nurses have come, doctors have come, mental health professionals have come. We even have a doula now. We have wraparound services for what our community needs, and they know that they can call us and they can't find what they need, or it's too high barrier through an institution that is connected to police. I think that an investment in what we're doing and what other organizations are doing, especially the folks that are on this call and uh, other organizations that can't be present all the time, would go a long way to change the number of calls that even happen. It's worth, it's worth trying. Thank you. So, and, and I think, um, Sheree, like all of those big questions around like capacity and scalability, like it's just, it's really becoming evident to me that that really is uh, um, one of the biggest hurdles that we're, we're trying to overcome right now. And um, I think it's a great transition too, to, to Dan Malone, right? Uh, um, our next um, person on the, the panel. Uh, because there's a lot of great work DESC is doing as well um, that uh, that is falling in that same that same category as some of the work Greenlight Project is doing and um, and so Dan uh, moving moving to you for your introductory comments um, you know obviously first I, you know, I want you to to introduce yourself what you do um, you know broad overview of what DESC does um, but I'm really interested in talking about mobile crisis uh, team King County Seattle mobile crisis team and how that offers a really good example of, of the kind of emergency response. And, um, and just really to, for people that are watching this at home to, to really get a sense that, um, and I think from all of our presenters today, it's like we're not, we're not starting from nothing with alternative types of first response. We, we truly are um, uh, you know, really blessed to have a variety of different responses um, that are uh, 
that are capable of, um, of stepping up in mobile crisis team. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Dan. It looks like Sharon Lee has joined us. Sharon, if you could make sure you're, you're on mute um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to you after Dan Malone, but welcome, it's great to see you here. Ready? Um, well, thanks so much. I appreciate being here, council member, and for you um, hosting this important topic. Um, my name is Daniel Malone. I work for DESC. We're a nonprofit social services agency um, with a harm reduction focus, um, uh, trying to meet uh, the needs of as many people as we can who are experiencing chronic homelessness and have significant behavioral health disabilities. And so we um, operate a variety of different kinds of programs, including survival services like shelters, um, uh, permanent supportive housing, and then an array of behavioral health care services. And uh, one of those um, behavioral health care services we operate is crisis focused. And um, there are several components to it, one of which is called the mobile crisis team that uh, we've talked about and that um, I believe you wanted me to focus on primarily here today. Um, uh, so do you want me to just go into an overview of that specifically right now or wait for that? No, I, I think that it'd be, uh, jumping into that right now would be great. Okay. Okay, great. And um, I, I really feel fortunate uh, to have followed uh, JM and Sheree because they set this up really, really well. Um, something that I wanted to be sure we were going to talk about in this conversation today is why are so many people having crises in the first place? Um, behavioral health crises we find um, very often are associated with the circumstances, the life circumstances that people are having. Um, and the vast majority of crisis events that we are responding to um, involve people currently experiencing homelessness, which says that um, being homeless itself is a condition that produces a lot of crisis. And so if we can provide appropriate um, housing and other um, social supports for people, we're going to have a lot less crisis in our communities to have to be dealing with. Um, while we don't have that in place and we have a lot of crisis events happening in the community, um, there are some things that um, are in place to try to assist people who are, are experiencing those crises. And one of those um, uh, uh, supports is this program that DESC runs called the Mobile Crisis Team. And this is a group of behavioral health professionals, mental health and substance use disorder specialists, um, who serve all of King County 24-7. It's a team of 38 professionals, um, and uh, they are um, summoned uh, mostly by first responder units, police or fire units around uh, the county, um, although not exclusively, I can get to that in a minute, um, uh, about a situation where a person is, is having some kind of mental health or substance use disorder crisis, and there is um, a hope that there can be support brought to the person in order to avoid an outcome involving um, jail or a hospital visit. And so um, the, the team of uh, the, the mobile crisis team unit of two people goes out anywhere in King County um, around the clock, uh, typically have about 4,000 plus uh, such events over the course of a year that um, we respond to. And um, they spend as much time as it takes with the person to um, try to help resolve the immediate behavioral health issue going on. Um, and that includes things like suicidal ideation to um, uh, a whole range of other types of behaviors that have been of concern to people in the community that you know, has brought the person ultimately to our attention. And um, sometimes the team is able to um, help the person find a disposition that involves um, going somewhere that the person is able to go. Maybe it could be their own home, although usually the person is experiencing homelessness, so they don't have their own home to go to. Could be um, going uh, where they have family. Um, but sometimes it involves going back to another facility DSE runs called the Crisis Solutions Center, 
where people can stay, receive psychiatric support, um, rest, receive food, um, and be there for a limited period of time to further help resolve the immediate crisis as well as um, work on plans for uh, the future when that, um, when that stay at the facility ends. The big um, sort of limitation that I wanted to raise here uh, that is in place currently is that um, because of the dearth of, of available and appropriate resources in the community that people really need, starting with housing, but also with shelter beds and other kinds of um, immediate basic supports that people really need, um, it is very often uh, that the, um, the, the disposition at the end of the of the um, service, uh, um, whether it's the, the, the several hour long mobile crisis team service or the, um, the end of the stay at the crisis solution center, um, too often the, the end result of um, that experience is that the person doesn't have a stable place to go to um, uh, when that is all over. Um, they don't have their own housing, and um, there is not enough capacity in the uh, shelter system to ensure that everybody has um, a place to go to. And so some people end up returning directly to the streets. And of course, that creates conditions um, that make it much more likely the person is going to go back into crisis again at some point, uh, sometimes in the not too distant future. So. Um, there's a lot of good that can happen from these kinds of interventions to help resolve immediate crises. It happens every single day, multiple times a day across King County. Um, but the, the um, lack of appropriate long-term support for people um, uh, causes this cycle to repeat all too often. Thank you, Dan. That, that's actually a really good segue before I, I want to ask you some follow up questions. But I think that since Sharon has joined us, I think it'd be a good segue to talk about um, the dearth of, uh, like, of housing as a resource on the other end of the contact. Um, so I, I think I'll try, I, I, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a perfectly queued up transition. So I think um, I want to go to Sharon and, and Sharon first, if you could provide uh, maybe just a brief introduction of, of the work that you do at Lehigh. Um, and, and your background, um, but then really talking about, uh, you know, I know that we've done, a, had a lot of conversations about permanent supportive housing, about tiny house villages, transitional shelters, and just, um, uh, um, you know, how we can sync up all of these types of first response that we're talking about here with those kinds of back-end investments so that, you know, the, the contact is just the first part of it. It's about, you know, how do we also get people inside, keep them inside, get them the resources they need to be successful. So um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you. So thank you very much. I'm Executive Director, Low Income Housing Institute, or people call us Lehigh for short. And um, I wanted to let people know that um, we don't just provide rental housing. Um, we own and operate 2,400 units of affordable housing. But we also operate the three urban rest stops, the hygiene centers for homeless people. We have one downtown, one in Ballard, one in the U District. So homeless people can clean up, take a shower, wash their clothes, get ready for work, or you know, um, go for a job interview. Um, hygiene is so critically needed. Uh, and then we also, um, we operate 12 tiny house villages, of which nine are in the city of Seattle. And we also operate permanent supportive housing. Um, we have been um, very fortunate that the um, city council has voted to um, approve the Jumpstart Seattle initiative, which is the um, payroll tax. And what that really means is that there is going to be significant funding for permanent supportive housing and rental housing, as well as um, some operating subsidies for people who are zero, almost like zero income or 20% of their median income. The other thing is that um, Mayor Durkin has recently um, put out a request for 500 units of permanent supportive housing, which is key. I mean, it's key to everything we're doing. So while we have people living in tiny houses, they're safe, it's stable, it's staffed, 
um, but it's a bridge. It's basically the tiny house is a bridge for people who are living in their car or um, on the street, um, people who are chronically homeless, many years living on the street, and then they can um, have their own tiny house and the tiny house is heated. And especially during the pandemic, they're not needing to share space with um, people in a congregate shelter. So I think we should take this opportunity um, to make sure that um, hotel rooms, hotels, maybe, maybe some hotels should be purchased, um, more tiny house villages. Um, you um, sponsored an amendment that was very successful for um, the city to add four to five tiny house villages um, because people can, you know, they don't have to share the tiny house with their neighbor next door. Um, so it's been very, um, very good in terms of um, the pandemic. But we have to, we have to scale up um, not only shelters, non-congregate shelters, but also permanent supportive housing and rental housing. So what's great about the tiny house village is that the case managers are on site and we also have um, behavioral health. And so the case manager is there helping people fill out um, housing applications, employment applications, getting income support, getting their stimulus check, um, you know, education. And so we have a very high success rate of people moving from um, a tiny house, um, reuniting them with family or friends, or moving into long-term permanent housing or Section 8 housing. But because the system is so clogged up, people have to wait somewhere until um, their name gets called if there's a waiting list or unless there's an opening. So I think with the pandemic, we have to keep people safe. Um, and the quickest way to do it is to um, either purchase hotels and make sure that the hotels can house people long-term and also um, build more tiny house villages. And while we wait for the permanent supportive housing to get built, which hopefully, you know, hopefully it'll be 500 more units of permanent supportive housing in a um, year and a half from now. So the situation is such that homelessness is increasing. And once the moratorium on eviction gets lifted, even more people are going to have a crisis, experience a crisis um, because um, they may not have been able to pay the rent during the moratorium and they owe the rent and they're gonna, they're gonna have to leave their apartment. So Sharon, can I follow up just real briefly um, with you? Because one thing that I, I want to um, talk about a little bit more is uh, the tiny house villages um, as a transitional strategy on, on getting folks uh, out of homelessness and, and you know, into permanent supportive housing. Um, if you could just maybe give an overview of um, you know, the, the success that you've seen with the tiny house villages uh, and how quickly they can be scaled up, because I think that is an important should be an important part of our strategy um, as a city in terms of, you know, we have a bottleneck right now of thousands of people living in unsanctioned encampments, right? And, and moving um, uh, more of uh, those opportunities into, into tiny house villages instead, or giving people the opportunity to be in a tiny house village and how we can do that a little faster because permanent supportive housing takes time. I wonder if you might just give us a little overview of that, because I do think it's an important part um, of our conversation today. Well, absolutely. So the city of Seattle has been a great partner because some of the tiny house villages are on city owned property. And also we have um, four villages that are on church sponsored property or church controlled property. And then we also have the Port of Seattle. Um, we have one village um, with um, you know, 50 to 60 people, housing 50 or 60 people on Port of Seattle property that's not being used. And so there's a variety of land that's um, vacant or could be developed into the future. But while it's vacant, there's an opportunity for like two to three years to use it as a um, tiny house village. Um, when the pandemic hit, um, we set up TC Spirit Village in five weeks. So we had tiny houses that were being built by volunteers um, and we have donors. And um, one of the um, builders is the um, Tulalip tribe. And they built these beautiful, um, the students in apprenticeship program, they built these beautiful um, tiny houses with Native American art. 
And that village, um, I think, is the first in the community that's dedicated to the needs of um, African American, Native American, and Alaskan Natives who have been um, overrepresented in terms of the um, homeless demographic, but underserved in our community. Um, and then we also have um, True Hope Village, which is um, sponsored by two churches, and it and the referrals are coming from the Urban League, the Indian Center. Um, homeless students from um, a job training program, as well as um, you know people in the community. So we um, we are having community buy-in and support locally, and each village has a community advisory group. Um, so the community advisory group includes um, neighbors, businesses, church leaders, and they um, you know they sort of monitor the progress and. Um, actually befriend the villagers and support the villagers. So it's been um, very, very successful. In um, Whittier Heights, we have one village for um, homeless women, and that's a harm reduction model. And then in um, South Lake Union, which is um, by the Marriott Hotel, um, we have a, um, a low barrier harm reduction um, village as well for um, men, women, and couples. And what's great about the um, villages is that you can bring your belongings and you have a, you know, it's your own tiny house. And then there are um, plum toilets and showers. There's kitchen, um, kitchen access, there's laundry access. So you don't have to like hunt around the neighborhood. You don't even need to go to the urban rest stop. Everything, it's like, you've got, you know, you've got all the facilities um, right where you live. And so it's been really, really good for, um, people who have been chronically homeless and people who have um, felt very isolated um, and miserable living in out in the cold or living in their car or under a bridge. So people's lives have been transformed. So we have over um, 50, I think it's 50 to 54 percent of people who exit a tiny house village um, move into long-term housing. And we have over, at this point, we have over, um, you know, 400 tiny houses. And so um, in Seattle, um, we're helping about um, a thousand people a year, a thousand homeless people a year. So they're ma it's making a big impact. Sharon, thank you for sharing that. I think it's so important because just as, as a strategy to, um, you know, to get rid of unsanctioned encampments, which all of, all of us can agree, like no one in Seattle wants folks uh, to be living in unsanctioned encampments, but we need to provide folks a place to go and I've really appreciated working with you um, on this. I want to pivot um, back over to Dan on the same subject um, to talk about some of the non-congregate work um, and de-intensification work that DESC has been doing um, while we're still on this. And then I, I want to ask Dan one more 911 response question before we close out um, the panel so I can get to some questions before we uh, sound off for the afternoon here. So, so Dan, um, I, I guess first, um, you know, DESC has been uh, doing great work that, that's been getting into the news around um, kind of hoteling, de-intensification. Um, and I, I'd be curious in, in just uh, kind of getting an update on that and, um, and, and how that has also helped to reduce COVID exposure and also just get more folks inside. Oh yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, for a long time, DESC has operated shelters um, they have typically been set up um, in uh, congregate environments um, and usually, uh, quite frankly, they're crowded environments and uh, the sleeping accommodations are bunk beds in rooms with lots of other people. And so when the pandemic emerged, it was quite clear that um, we needed a different kind of environment in order to avoid the spread of the virus um, quickly among a very vulnerable population group. So the, the DESE shelters have long had an emphasis on serving people with uh, very high needs, um, very often people who have uh, been referred directly from hospital emergency departments and inpatient units. Um, and so it's a very frail, uh, medically compromised population quite often. And so We've had the opportunity during the pandemic to relocate some of our shelter operations to a hotel setting. Um, King County leased a property that DESC um, moved our staff to operate in uh, Renton and um, closed down our main shelter operation in Pioneer Square 
and moved everybody there to this hotel setting. And that allows people to have individual rooms and be socially distant from each other. Um, and we haven't had any COVID cases at all in that environment, and uh, which is not true of some of the existing uh, congregate shelters we've uh, continued to operate uh, during this time. Um, and more importantly, it is uh, um, proving to be just a much better environment for people in lots of other ways. Um, there is much less crisis that happens in the environment because it's a more pleasant, spacious, commodious environment um, that allows people who are under a lot of stress to have a better opportunity to manage that and regulate their own behaviors than when they're in the crowded environments that are much less pleasant to be in. And so we think it's a real uh, model for what the future could look like in terms of uh, emergency shelter to the extent that shelter continues to be necessary. We'd like to not have any shelter at all because everybody should have actual housing that's permanent that they can maintain. But um, it's been a good uh, transition uh, for this period during the pandemic to have the hotel setting instead of the big crowded congregate shelters. Thanks, Dan. And, and I, I wanted to, um, uh, to just say too that, that your example and that and the leadership DESC has shown was was instrumental in the council, um, you know, making a commitment to put more resources into into um, uh, non congregate shelter settings. So I, I appreciate your innovation there. But my um, my last question, and then I, I want to transition to to um, uh, to questions for me. Uh, is you know we talked a lot today about these sort of alternative harm reduction based first responses. You know, we talked about the uh, mobile crisis team. Um, what, uh, what is the prospect, um, do you think, for, uh, for scalability and 911 integration with the mobile crisis team? And, and could that be a model um, that could work in King County? Um, and, and what do you think the big, the big hurdles to that would be and, and how we might go about it? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, as some of the earlier um, panelists were talking, uh, including the folks from Denver, very often there really is not any need for a law enforcement presence um, during the uh, behavioral health crises that people have. And um, uh, so the question for our area is, is there, is there a way to um, have more direct referral so there is a first response of behavioral health specialists instead of that really being the second response, which is more or less what's happening today um, because um, police or fire units have gone first because that's what 911 does. It dispatches police or fire in this area. So it seems totally doable to me that we could make these adjustments to our local system and uh, work something out where um, uh, uh, and it, a program like the mobile crisis team could be, um, uh, you know, summoned by the 911 system um, without it first going through police or fire. Um, I am very eager to engage in those kinds of conversations and see what we can do. I think we're going to need to scale this up to be much larger. Right now, it is limited to some extent because um, uh, police or fire units will. Um, will make the determination first about whether they want to um, utilize the services of the mobile crisis team. And then they hand over the case. They don't stay on the scene when the mobile crisis team gets there um, because there really isn't a purpose for them to remain there. And so it makes all the sense in the world to me that there would be modifications that we all could make to this. There is a way currently where um, the mobile crisis team can be dispatched without there being any kind of law enforcement or fire EMS involvement in the first place. And that's um, through the um, crisis line that people can call and report a situation. And then the crisis line uh, makes a determination um, about whether the mobile crisis team might be an appropriate intervention in that situation. Um, and that happens a minority of the, of the events. And I think that's mostly because um, the general public is unaware that 
um, the crisis line is something that they might think about calling when they see a situation they're concerned about. Most people are just conditioned to dial those three digits that everybody knows. And um, at least in our area, we have not yet made any kind of provision for the 911 system being able to dispatch um, behavioral health specialists directly. And I think that is uh, something we ought to, we ought to start um, uh, solving. Well, I look forward to continuing to have those conversations uh, with you, Dan, and thank you so much for being here and, and sharing that. Uh, you know, with that, I, I want to move on because, I, I mean, we, we, are, we are well past when I said I would start taking um, questions, and I'm sure Camila has a lot of them stored up. So, um, you know, everyone who was, who was on this panel and the previous panels, thank you so much um, uh, for tuning in. And if you, if you want to stick around, if there's a question that comes up and, um, and, and you are willing to, to help me answer it, if it's about uh, something pertaining to, to your area of expertise, you're welcome to stay. Um, otherwise, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to stay if um, if, if you don't want to. So uh, I'll um, uh, let you get get back to your evening and afternoon. If you want to stick around, that's perfectly fine. But um, greatly appreciate all of you coming here to share what you're doing and and um, uh, and the work that we are doing as a city. So thank you so much. Um, with that, I want to move uh, to Camila on my staff, who has been patiently aggregating a lot of your questions. Uh, it's 4.56 um, with the indulgence of IT and comms. I, I'd like to go till 5.10 and maybe see if I can get off um, a couple of these questions uh, just answering as, a, um, as an individual. I know that we've been able to aggregate a lot of them by theme. Um, so I, I think that we uh, would be able to do that. And, and obviously, if we can't get to all of them, we can get to some in writing. But um, with that, um, Camila, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, if you want to start uh, asking questions and I'll, I'll just um, provide some answers. Hi, thank you, Councilmember Lewis. Um, the first question that I have is, why did the city council specifically pick 50% funding cuts to SPD? And the second part to that question is, why isn't SPD involved in this town hall today? Uh, thank you, those are really good questions. Um, first, the 50% the number has come um, from the, the decrim Seattle, uh, um, coalition of folks that, that we as a council and, and honestly a city government are, are working with. Indeed, a lot of the recommendations that the mayor has put forward and part of her broader cut plan um, have actually come from uh, decrim Seattle and King County Equity Now. Uh, you know, as I've said in the past, I think that 50% um, uh, is a good goal when you really look uh, in the entire perspective of what the department does currently. And, and when you look at how, and you know, I think J, um, JM is still on, um, on this call, but when you especially look um, at how, as, as was discussed early in the, earlier in this presentation by Sheree and JM, um, you know, some of it is, is the civilianization of existing services. So um, moving 911 um, to be an independent civilian body um, would maintain that service, but taking it out of SPD would in and of itself be a 10% cut. And I'm not saying that uh, to imply that, you know, we're, we're going to get to, um, a, you know, a defund goal at any level merely by doing ledger changes, but just saying that some of it is um, the civilianization of existing functions and existing services um, and moving them. Um, and when you start looking at it in that context, um, it does become uh, a more reasonable goal. Uh, the, you know, the extension, um, or by extension, uh, part of the reason uh, that I didn't invite um, SPD to this town hall, um, you know, I don't have an aversion to inviting SPD to future town halls or, or even necessarily this one. I spent this morning um, doing a ride along with the crisis intervention team, uh, which is another um, uh, collaboration between DESC uh, and the police department that responds to, um, to more dangerous, potentially more dangerous uh, mental health calls um, that is an officer teamed up with a social worker. Um, the, the purpose of this town hall um, in terms of the presentations is, is I wanted to respond to what has been a common concern in the community, which is, okay, so if, if not police, then what? Um, and I think that we have a decent idea. You know, if, if I did have police presenting in a panel like this, it'd be like, okay, well, you know, we're the police, we respond to crimes. What I really wanted to show is, uh, you know, that we have a lot of um, responses that the police are currently responding to that are um, public health or, or low acuity kinds of calls. And I wanted to give the public an example 
and the people of District 7 an example of the types of first response systems out there that could take on those calls so that the police don't have to. Um, and that is the question that I was trying to answer at this town hall. Um, and, you know, certainly in the future, because uh, we are going to be having conversations about um, uh, significant public safety changes uh, for the next several months. It's not going to end uh, right now in the summer. Um, I certainly intend to have um, uh, presenters from SP SPD present as we go into uh, the fall budget session and are making really big decisions about the 2021 budget, um, which are going to be really, really critical for reshaping how we do public safety. Uh, so Camille, I can do a, uh, another question. Did we lose Camila? Or maybe you're still muted, Camila. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, 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 I think you were muted. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, no worries. So the next question that I have is, um, is the vision to have a model that supports responders from groups like both Health One and uh, STAR slash CAHOOTS? Well, we're going to have a community visioning process with Decrim Seattle, um, you know, with, with a lot of community and neighborhood organizations that's really going to shape uh, what this is going to look like. What I wanted to do in this town hall is just give the community an overview of kind of where we're starting from uh, and the example of what some other cities are doing. And, and that can be a jumping off point for, um, for what we're going to do in a, um, uh, in a community driven and community led conversation. Um, I'm not necessarily here to endorse uh, um, any one of these responses um, that, that came up uh, today, um, but more to just sort of make it apparent that there are some, there are alternatives. There are things we can do to respond uh, to these types of calls that aren't police, that are viable, that other places are doing, and that are showing success. And uh, there might be room for having, uh, you know, Health One respond to certain calls and having something like STAR respond to other calls. There might be ways to build on and expand uh, the mobile crisis team to make it something that, that is kind of like a star of cahoots. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's also going to be a question, no matter what we do, we need to be scaling up, as, as Sharon and Dan Malone, uh, Sharon Lee and Dan Malone were saying, um, the housing and the exits on the other side, because a lot of these problems are related to chronic homelessness. Um, and we need to be making sure that, uh, that as we go forward, um, we are, we're not only providing first response, but we're also providing um, those exits on the other side and those resources on the other side. So that was what um, I was trying to accomplish with this town hall is, is providing kind of a, you know, here's a bunch of our options. Uh, now we are going to have a community process to determine, um, you know, do we do just one of them? Do we do several of them? And, um, and you know, I won't be the only voice in that discussion. And I hope to, to use my position to um, uh, continue to use forums like this to, to present variety of different ideas and and um, and inform the public on on the universe of things that are out there okay the next question is during your 2019 campaign you advocated for more officers for SPD crime has not gone down so how would you support a 50 percent defunding of SPD now thank you uh, for that question um, so uh, when I was uh, running um, for Seattle City Council last year, I did totally support um, an increase in police staffing. I actually supported an increase in police staffing as recently as um, February of this year when we had a police staffing report in the Public Safety Committee. Uh, the thing that really changed for me was uh, when we got a presentation recently during our uh, summer balancing session from SPD, and you know, contrary to some narratives that have been out there in the world, um, the council has been actually working extensively with SPD in this information gathering stage and SPD has been really great um, at providing that data, providing that information and presenting it to the council. We've been working extensively with um, Dr. Fisher, who is, who is one of the head um, uh, um, policy folks um, in the Seattle uh, Police Department. And the statistic that really stood out to me uh, and, and what makes this town hall so relevant, and, and I actually should have set it at the top of the town hall, 56% um, of all of the police calls, um, all the 911 calls police are responding to, 56%, a, a clear majority, are non-criminal calls. And that doesn't mean that those are calls that are non-violent. 
Or that doesn't mean that those are calls that are, you know, like for misdemeanors or something like that. It means they're non-criminal. It means they are for conduct that is not criminal. Um, you know, there's always going to be a role in Seattle um, for, for the police. I, I am convinced and I believe that, that, you know, in a, in a um, country where it is so easy to get a gun, there are going to be exigent public safety situations where you need an armed first response. But the reality is um, our police are spending a lot of their time responding to um, uh, um, public health and, uh, and quality of life issues uh, that um, they should not be the first responder for. Uh, and when I heard that, I mean, what it made really clear to me is that we certainly need more first response. There is no way we don't need more first response. But that those new first responders should be the police. The 911 um, call data doesn't bear that out for me. Um, and that's why I'm certainly open to right-sizing our first response by engaging in the kind of um, systems and responses that we discussed in the town hall today. Um, because the police should be, they should be spending their time responding to and working on crimes. Um, they shouldn't be spending their time um, necessarily responding to these um, types of issues that a, uh, a low acuity first response like Health One or, um, or like the STAR program in Denver or Cahoots in Eugene or Mobile Crisis Intervention Team could take on. And I think that that's really the conversation we need to be having is we need more first response, but the data doesn't necessarily bear out that that should be the police. Thank you for that. Um, the next question um, deals with how do you work with people who do not want help or can't recognize that they need help or they don't want to, any kind of like housing or assistance? Yeah, I mean, and that's always gonna be a really big challenge and I pose that question all the time. I know that um, Dan uh, is still on here. I don't wanna um, uh, put him, um, on the spot, but I, I kind of do just in the sense that Dan um, is actually a, a service provider, um, you know, I, whereas I am, um, I'm a policymaker, but I'm not, I'm not myself an, a, an expert in behavioral mental health. Um, so I think that I would um, hand that over to Dan um, to get an answer from him. Well, thanks. I mean, it's a common question, actually. Um, and I think, um, the answer lies in um, that when it appears people are rejecting help, um, what they're really rejecting is what's being offered to them because it's they don't perceive it to be meeting their needs. And we've discovered over and over again that people who are labeled as difficult or difficult to serve um, are actually very eager to improve their life situations and they will accept something when um, they assess it to be applicable to um, what their needs and wants are. And housing is usually that thing for people on the street who are experiencing homelessness. Um, a lot of times people do not wanna go into a program. That's very often because they've been through programs, every conceivable kind of program before um, but having a safe, decent place to stay is almost universally desired by folks. Now, sometimes they may not really believe um, what you're offering, um, that uh, they think there are going to be a lot of strings attached and, um, you know, they're going to have to go into something where a young social worker is going to start telling them all the changes they need to make in their lives. And so they are reluctant, but um, when you can establish rapport with people and um, form some relationship um, and you can get past that kind of stuff and really get to the place where um, uh, folks who were believed to be, you know, kind of beyond help or, or refusing to make changes are really um, eager to accept offers of housing and they do so much better when that happens. Thanks, Dan. The, the only other thing that, that I would share um, that's just anecdotal is, uh, as I've started doing more press talking about cahoots and, and kind of that model of like a low acuity community based first response, um, you know, my office did get contacted. I'm, I'm not going to say their name um, or even use gendered pronouns to refer to them because I, I do want to respect their um, privacy. But uh, they did tell me uh, that they had received, you know, that they were homeless in Eugene. And they had received first response over their lifetime on, on the West Coast, the East Coast, 
um, everywhere that had been, um, that had not categorically uh, helped them um, get through in their life for their particular high barrier needs. Um, and that the cahoots response was immediately and noticeably different um, to this person when they were in crisis in Eugene and really helped uh, to turn their life around. And uh, a lot of the things that the, the star people mentioned earlier about being, uh, being dressed more casually, being more approachable, um, you, you know, just really having a different rapport um, that, that worked for that person. And I really think part of it is, um, and, and this is an argument in favor of having multiple types of first response available is, that, you know, different things are gonna, are, are gonna work for different people. And, and I think some of it with the population that we, we routinely label as high barrier um, or having, uh, having a lot of issues and refusing offers of help is just um, making sure that we are structuring first response systems that are more directly responsive um, and, and perceived as being more um, credible um, to that person. And, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, that, that story of mine is just anecdotal, but um, this was a person that, that took the time to, you know, to see this in the news, who was living in Seattle, who was housed um, now and, and has had, uh, had their life been turned around from their contact with Cahoots and it hadn't up until then. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, that's just one person, but it's still a powerful story and it still matters. So, um, you know, there's no easy answers. Uh, but Camila, how about we do one more, one more question? Um, yeah. So I believe that JM wants to, to, to jump in and, and respond to one of the, uh, the questions, but the, let's let's after. Oh, um, sorry, um, I, JM, I didn't know you were still on the call. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And so after this response, let, can we have the last question? Yes, I think that, I think that makes sense. Yeah, this, yeah, this I, is kind of, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I'll just go real quick. Um, responding to the question of 50%, why Decrim Seattle proposed that. And so we have been learning that the SPD budget has grown by 43% in the last 10 years. And since 2012, there's been $100 more spent per Seattle light um, on policing. And so this doesn't correlate with an increase in crime rate, but it does correlate with the increase in houselessness and gentrification in the city. And we're seeing that the police is the first, are the first responders for many of these situations, and that's, at, that's too easy. And it comes at great cost to BIPOC communities. And when I think of Chardonnay Laos, a lot of us have been impacted by this police murder. Um, things would have been really different if it was not police who responded to her situation. So that's why we're saying, you know, the 50% can go to community programs, can go to community responses, to housing, to support, rather than just be invested in the police as just this really easy, almost lazy response to social crisis in the city. JM, thank you so much. And, and um, sorry, if I, if, I had, if I had seen that you were still here, I would have actually um, asked you to jump in on that um, question earlier. So um, thank you uh, for, for reaching out to Camila and, and flagging that, I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, Camila, why, why don't we do one more question and then I will, um, uh, I will commit to responding to the rest of the questions personally by email. I know that we did get a lot in, but we can aggregate those and, and try to respond. Um, uh, in an, in another form. So, uh, but what's the, what's the next question, Camille? Uh, this is a question that, uh, came in from maybe three other people curious, uh, who and what kind of response would be available for prostitution of drug use and illegal, uh, encampments under this 50%, um, defund? Um, that's a really good question. I, I kind of wish Sheree was still here to talk a little bit about what um, uh, the work that Greenlight Project has been doing on um, uh, sex worker outreach uh, and diversion. Um, uh, you know, I, I guess that, I mean, my response um, to that would be uh, going back to the conversation earlier with Sharon and, and Dan, you know, like uh, when we have on offer um, placements for tiny houses, placement for, um, for hotel, um, hotel rooms connected to vouchers, um, placements to transitional shelter, to permanent supportive housing. Um, that is the, the surest fire strategy um, to get rid of unsanctioned encampments. So I, I'm going to say that first off. It's also a, a surefire strategy um, to, uh, to provide some safe place for someone to be if they're trying to 
um, get out of a, um, uh, a cycle where they are uh, um, engaged in, in sex work and trafficking. So, you know, I might actually um, uh, turn it over maybe to Sharon for a second on this one, um, just to kind of talk about the work that Lehigh has done with the NAV team um, in being our referral service uh, for the NAV team and just how the, you know, a lot of the folks that get into tiny house villages came from unsanctioned encampment. So uh, Sharon, I don't know if you want to take that um, uh, or not, just to answer briefly. Well, yes. Well, um, I think um, what the NAV team has found out is that um, the people who are living in dangerous locations or where there's um, um, what they consider hotspots, um, problems, that when they offer people shelter, um, people will, t people will um, accept a referral to a tiny house village, um, but they're less inclined to want to move to a um, congregate shelter because they're already in their own tent or they're in their car and they want that privacy and they value that privacy. So um, we did find out that the NAV team has told us that the, um, the, um, there's a great um, receptivity when there's an offer for a um, tiny house. Now, what I will say is that historically, REACH, which is a nonprofit, was involved in referrals. And um, we are supporting um, sort of like um, that we don't have to have the NAV team make referrals because oftentimes when the NAV team is making referrals, um, it's sort of like also under duress. You know, the, um, the place has been posted. Um, there's gonna be a sweep. The sweep has been announced. Um, people are frantic trying to figure out, um, you know, when the police are coming and then the NAV team sort of comes with the police. What we're finding out is that if we had um, community-based outreach workers um, that can um, go to the same places, right? And voluntarily, not under you know, coercion, but voluntarily say, hey, we've got a tiny house here or we've got um, shelter there. Um, we'll show you a picture of the village. Um, you know, this village is a little different than that village. Um, this shelter is over, you know, in this part of the, um, you know, in the in the community, or it's far away. Or do you need, um, you know, do you need gas money? Um, do you need um, transportation home if they're, you know, out of state? I mean, like, it's much more. Um, the um, our social workers and case managers and outreach workers are much better at engaging people to have them successfully leave a place that's dangerous. And I just want to give one example. Um, there were a lot of homeless people who were um, camped out at CHOP, who were camped out on Capitol Hill and Cal Anderson Park. And they um, said that they thought that they were going to be given a place to camp together, right? But then they quickly heard from the mayor's office that no, um, the mayor's office was not going to allow them to pack up, move together to um, a park, right? Because of the, um, you know, ban on, on camping in a park. So the place got posted, um, you know, and they were on the um, Seattle Central College campus. So um, on July 17th, um, Lehigh staff and volunteers went to um, Broadway and Pine without the NAV team. And we moved 20 people, 20 people that weekend into tiny houses and shelters, our lakefront shelter, which is a 24 hour shelter, right? And we were, you know, we were successful doing that and we didn't have to have the NAV team. And then of course, sure enough, on Tuesday morning, after we had, you know, moved everyone, Tuesday morning, the NAV team and police came to do their sweep. And so basically we got people out of harm's way with voluntarily asking them to, would you like to move here? Would you like to, you know, we moved someone to, um, you know, this village, that village, um, you know, and it worked out really well without the NAV team engagement. And I will say another thing I would advocate is that people who have lived experience, people who were formerly homeless or currently homeless are actually very good at doing outreach as well. So if we paired people who are currently, you know, with lived experience with a traditional outreach, you know, um, case, case manager, 
outreach worker, I think we have a winning combination. So we sort of, um, you know, um, make sure that the police are not involved in moving people into housing, but that we have um, friendly, you know, um, peers and um, community workers who are doing this. I think you'll see a great, um, great success with this um, approach. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I think that's a good way to to end it out here, and I just want to make a couple a couple brief closing remarks here uh, um, to the town hall. We we didn't get to all the questions, but we did. Um, I did uh, work to try to incorporate some of them um, into the panels earlier um, to to inform those discussions, and um, uh, certainly I'm uh, I would like to um, respond to them in writing. The ones that we couldn't respond to here. Um, in the town hall, but I do want to thank everybody for tuning in and attending. Um, you know, certainly invite people to continue to make their views known on the issues before the council um, via email. Um, I, I would warn everybody, um, we have an inbox of over uh, 20,000 emails because people have not been um, hesitant to, to write in and express their opinions, which is great and, and good for our democracy in the city. Uh, so I encourage people to continue to do that. We do still um, sort by subject matter and try to be as responsive as possible given those hurdles um, of uh, being able to do um, quick one-on-one uh, -on -one responses given that volume. But um, people are free to email me at andrew.lewis uh, at seattle.gov um, to express their, um, their views on these issues today or, or um, anything else. Uh, you know, I, I do just want to state that um, you know, we are in the middle of trying to do something um, uh, really unprecedented in this country. We are not the only city that is talking about fundamentally um, uh, uh, rebuilding um, how we do public safety and really critically examining um, the historic um, power imbalances uh, that have served to the detriment of our black and brown neighbors um, and how um, policing has historically been conducted in this country and in this city. Uh, you know, we can take stock of a lot of the great progress that we've made, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of the first to admit that uh, the Seattle Police Department has made a lot of progress um, uh, over the last decade, but that progress has not nearly gone far enough to rise to the type of system that we really need to come together to create, uh, and that path goes through the types of first response and community investments um, and BIPOC-led projects that we discussed today um, in this meeting. Um, my hope is that uh, this conversation um, will help um, allay uh, the fears and concerns of some folks out there um, who are worried uh, that a um, uh, potential decreases in the police um, would lead to uh, no one responding in the event that there was a violent crime. Uh, I think it's the commitment of myself and, and my colleagues to make sure that um, we do maintain functional first response but that certain types of first response and a considerable number of um, types of first response require a different approach um, as evidenced by a lot of the ideas that we talked about today and indeed looking at some of the stuff that we ourselves are doing that can be scaled. So I look forward to continuing this conversation. Really appreciate um, all the great panelists that came and joined us, um, uh, including Chief Scoggins um, from the fire department, um, uh, um, Roshan Bliss, uh, and um, uh, Carly Salon from uh, the STAR program, um, Sheree LaSalle's um, and J.M. Wong from Decrim Seattle, uh, and of course, Daniel Malone from uh, the Downtown Emergency Service Center, and Sharon Lee um, from Lehigh. I uh, want to also thank uh, Kat, uh, Catherine Sims for um, uh, helping set this up, and Camila Brown for, for moderating the questions on my staff. Um, and of course, our, our uh, IT team and our comms team at the city of Seattle for making this possible. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, uh, the, a link to this will be provided on my website. So if you want to um, share this town hall with your friends or, or distribute to your networks, um, more than welcome to do so. Uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity to um, spend the afternoon with everybody here and um, I hope you have an excellent evening. So thank you so much. <laughs>